nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. Uh, wonderful lads that do a great job there. And it's worth reading about that man there. So he bets the man needs to rest and the numbers reveal why. Times ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good writing about that on the Managing Madrid website. Such a great podcast as well. Pere Valverde was a huge part of the equation. Hello and welcome to a Monday edition of the Managing Madrid Podcast. I'm your host, Kian Sabani, and I'm joined every Monday and every Thursday by Lucas Navarrete, who is here right now. It's El Dia Después, but really two days after because Real Madrid played on Saturday. So, Lucas Navarrete with his Denver, Denver Broncos hat. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing Fine, I'm doing better than the Broncos. <laughs> I had a terrible loss uh, last Monday. I think it was. It was terrible, but anyway. You know me. I don't know anything about football. But uh, <laughs> I have a uh, fantasy basketball draft that I'm doing on Wednesday oh. night with a group of 10 people. I'm going to try my best to grab Jokic. No, you should. You yeah. should fantasy dream. Uh, he's a uh, he's a fantasy freak, for, uh, definitely with his assists and the, yeah. the rebounds and all that. Yeah, he's he's quite possibly the best uh, fantasy player in the NBA. I think uh, I I haven't been a, I haven't been playing fantasy NBA in quite a while. I was big into into it years ago, but w- w- before Jokic w- uh, got to his peak and all that, but I have to assume that if everything stayed the same and the same rules and all that, Jokic should be in definitely number one player in the, in the in a fantasy draft, yeah. Noted. I don't know about number one necessarily, but I'm going to try to nab him. We'll see. I don't know what order I'll be in, and I'm hoping that the other people just... Um... Just lay some eggs and and leave me. I did I did fantasy basketball last year for the first time. With the thirtieth oh. pick, I took LeBron James. He still mm. he was still available. What's your like, competition? <laughs> they're pretty like I mean to be to be. The thing is with LeBron is no matter what if he's playing he's going to put up numbers so I don't really know why he no, dropped that far, far down but anyways good so yeah. percentages also in shooting and all that so yeah strange strange yeah. Um, so we're going to talk about Real Madrid things and there's not that much on the agenda and Lucas and I really didn't know what we were going to talk about before we hit record. So we're going to see where this goes, but obviously we can, we can unearth some talking points pretty easily. And we are coming off of what I described in the Hatape post game show as one of the most boring games I've ever seen, but same. It was, it was just that it was it was just it was it was uneventful that's the thing like the point i brought up was that there are plenty of nil nils but something happens you know this one was one nil but there are even like a nil nils i mean like there are things that happen chances missed there are maybe a red card somewhere maybe a fight maybe some brawls maybe a controversial decision there was like very little in this game apart from Katafi playing the, the way they did, then the exception was in this particular game was that at no point did Katafi really open up and make the game exciting. It's just like, it was like they would rather have lost 1-0 than, than lose 2-0 and try to come back into the game, you know? So it was a bit of a, a, bit of, a, bit of a tough nut to crack and a bit of a boring game to dissect, but we still managed to pull out one hour nearly on the post-game show, so that was proud of us for that. But what were your takeaways from the game? It was, as you mentioned, it was a, a really poor game overall. Not only poor uh, from Real Madrid's side, I it was really hard to watch, to be honest. Uh, luckily, Real Madrid got the three points, which is obviously what matters. But uh, you have to assume that maybe Real Madrid are taking their foot off the gas a little bit in these games lately in terms of playing with intensity, with uh, with aggression, and all that late in late in the game, as soon as they get uh, as they get the lead, I have to assume that it is related to how busy the schedule is going to to be later in the season. Also, right now, but you have to assume that this is a factor right now because otherwise, I think that Real Madrid are not playing very great football. Hopefully, this is just Real Madrid taking things a little bit lightly when when they get the lead and and taking their foot off the gas. I think that it was. Uh, 
quite boring and, and difficult to watch uh, as a game. The, the best thing is that Real, no injuries, obviously, and also Real Madrid got the three points without Benzema and Courtois, which is uh, uh, an important thing. Well, it's interesting that, you know, heading into the Classico, though, obviously there are, there's one game left for each team, respectively. We have Shakhtar, Barca as Inter. As of right now, it's like the two teams that are running away with the league and two really, really good teams on paper, but neither are really playing well right now. Um, Barca's results and performances have been what they've been. It hasn't been great, even in their wins. And Real Madrid's last three games, I guess, Mallorca, or sorry, Osasuna, Shakhtar, and Getafe. The only one that I can yeah. say we, we played really well was Shakhtar, but that obviously, we didn't finish well. We just, I think we did a lot of good things before the, fin- mm. the finishing sucked. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's not like both of us are like at the apex of our powers right now heading into the Classico, but w- it'll be interesting to see what, what happens in that game. But, you know, I, we won. Well, all them, yeah. all that, that's the only thing I'll really remember. If the season ends, we won- become champions. I'll just remember that that was a W. I won't necessarily remember that it was terrible or, or really boring or whatever. And I don't, think, I don't think there was a lack of intent. I do think there was a tough low block to break. And it just, we never had that moment, that watershed moment in the second half where we bring on subs and the opposing team opens up. That just never happened in this game. And that usually happens. Um, it just didn't happen against Getafe and Osasuna. Yeah, luckily, as you mentioned, also I've, Barcelona have been playing quite bad uh, in, in recent weeks. In fact, they could have really easily dropped points against Celta last night. I thought Celta did more than enough to at least win a point at, at the Camp Nou last night, which is something considering that it's obviously the Camp Nou and that Celta are obviously in fifth team there. And Barca have uh, the good thing for Real Madrid is that while Ancelotti is allowed to 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 make at least some rotations in the in Tuesday's match against uh, Shakhtar because of how well Real Madrid are uh, uh, positioned in the in the group stage right now. Barcelona have to play uh, all in against Inter uh, just because they they lost against them last week and that's a, a very intense game, an emotional game for them. Also on Wednesday, while Real Madrid play on Tuesday, so Real Madrid have uh, should have the advantage when it comes to to to, to how both teams get uh, to a Clasico. I think so. This is something Ancelotti should probably take advantage of. I think uh, I've said on Twitter that I expect some rotations uh, against Shakhtar on Tuesday. I expect. Possibly the best, the first uh, time that Vinicius might actually stay on the bench um, or start the game on the bench uh, this season. I think that obviously he's a young player. He should not, uh, he should not be managed the way Modric, Benzema, Kroos, or other veterans are being managed simply because he's younger and, and all that, and also because he's in great form. But he he will also need some rest uh, down the road, and I think this is a very good opportunity for Ancelotti to to give him the rest he will probably need or benefit from later in this season. I think that it, it will be a, a good opportunity for Ancelotti to, to rotate his squad and give the veterans and the starters an even bigger advantage when, when a Clásico comes on Sunday. Do you rest Benzema or do you play him? It's tough. I, uh, on one hand, I think he could probably benefit from, from resting. And on the other hand, the fact that he hasn't been finishing great or, or at all in recent games uh, since he got back from his injury, I think that Benzema could need a, a boost of confidence and, and, to, and to increase uh, his numbers a little bit. So that I, I would probably play him. I would probably start him and... and may take him off by the 70th minute or so, hoping that he has already found the back of the net and whatever. But I think that he could benefit more from a boost in confidence and from seeing the ball hitting net than from spending another match uh, getting some rest. I think that it would be important for Benzema to find a bit of, of confidence boost and morale before Clásico. I agree. I think, I think in this particular case, resting would be detrimental to getting momentum. I, I think he, look, it's, it's kind of a t- difficult one to juggle. Just as I agree with you that it's more advantageous for us to going into classical top of our group and then playing away to Shakhtar 
and not not even in Ukraine in Warsaw, but uh, playing away from home and without pressure. Then having to go against Inter Milan, who are a really tough defensive unit, who are great on the counterattack, also very physical, and are going to most likely give you hell even if you win. Mm-hmm. You don't want you want to see them really fight it out. That that that. It, and hope that it's a bloodbath, even if Barca win it, that game, just so they can. But having said that, that actually may give them more confidence for the classical if that happens. So you know, it's a double-edged sword. Sometimes things don't go as according to plan in the football. Sometimes you know he they'll come out of that like with super a lot of momentum, and then we take it way too easy against Shakhtar because we're overconfident. We're looking ahead to Classico, and then we we drop points, and that could also derail our confidence. So who knows? There's no science to this, but um, I think there are a couple players that could really benefit from just for lack of a better word, stat padding to, to, to just run the numbers up. Because as we've seen the last three games, we haven't been finishing well. We really need a Benzema goal. I actually had a dream last night that Benzema scored a goal. That's <laughs> like what my you subconscious your dreams. is. Yeah, my subconscious <laughs> is nothing else, but it's, it's, not like, it's not like lying on a beach. It's not flying through the air. It's just, it's not like, like. <laughs> parties. It's not anything it's other than please Benzema score a goal. That's what my subconscious is. So I had a dream last time that Benzema scored a goal and it was huge for his confidence. So I'm hoping that that's what happens. But I really think he would benefit more from scoring in this game rather than not playing at all and resting because I think the scoring and the momentum that'll carry him to Classico is important. And by extension, I, I agree with you. I don't think Vinicius, I think we should really bubble wrap Vinicius, but, you know, I think anyone could score from anyone could benefit from scoring goals right now. The other one I, I think about is Modric. Um, we've had so many discussions about is he in the Onsen the Gala after we saw that Shakhtar 11. I really think it's still hard to bench Modric for a big game like this, but no way he's on the bench on Sunday. I don't think. No yeah. way. So who sits out no in that way. situation? Fede or Rodrigo? Possibly Rodrigo, Rodrigo. Yeah. That's. Uh, to me, it's it's quite clear to me. Like um, it's like I give it I don't know eighty or ninety percent chance that Rodrigo is the one sitting on the bench. I think it's it's quite clear and quite obvious to me that it's it's what's going to happen. I mean, really, which I is th- which is which isn't yeah sorry which no, isn't ahead. that bad exactly considering how how good he is off the bench. I think it's good to have a player of his caliber of the bench, and I think that Real Madrid have uh, suffered a bit of uh, lack of depth of the bench in in recent weeks. I don't like seeing men Mariano or Asensio playing this many minutes uh, and all that. I like Rodrigo being the first man uh, of the bench, and I think that it's it's what's going to happen on on Sunday in El Clasico. It's it's fairly fairly clear and obvious to me. Yeah, last year. In the onset of the gala, there was only really one question mark, right? And it was the right wing. Mm-hmm. Rodrigo or Fede. By the, by the end of the mm-hmm. season, those were the two. And it was Fede usually, and then Rodrigo comes off the bench. This year's onset of the gala, would you say it's between... It's still one position, but it's three players? Modric, mm-hmm. Fede, and Rodrigo. It seems like it like might be those three that would be expendable. Because I don't think Cruz and Chiuameni will sit. Vinicius and Benzema for sure won't. And then are the remaining options? Um, I guess it's two positions open, right? So out of the 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 last two spots, it's Fede, Rodrigo, and Modric is is basically yeah. going to be. It's going to be two out of those three who start. So yeah, and I think Valverde has come uh, closer to uh, Modric's importance within the team. So I think it all. Valverde has probably risen a little bit in his in in death chart here, and I think it, you know, and Modric on the other hand seems to be obviously because of his age and all that seems to have uh, dropped a little bit of of his importance. So the competition is is probably closer between Modric and and Valverde right now than it is between Valverde and Rodrigo than it was last season. I think the competition right now, like for possibly. Um, well, it's obviously one uh, like Valverde and Modric. Like to me, the two of them are going to start, and it's quite clear to me that Rodrigo will sit on the bench. But as time uh, keeps uh, passing by and all that, we probably will see uh, a competition between Valverde and Modric. Hopefully, if Rodrigo keeps uh, playing the way he is right now, but I don't think 
uh, that's going to happen now. I think it's a little bit too soon or too early for, for Rodrigo to win that status yet. Do you remember, like, there was a period under Zidane where Fede Valverde started over Modric in, like, two or three straight Clásicos. And we thought that, and it, it seems so long ago now, but it actually was a decent amount of time ago. And it's amazing to think that since then, like, Modric has still gone strong. Like, I, I really thought during that period where Modric was sitting the Clásicos, even when he was healthy, it was like, okay, this is the beginning of the transition. Like, that was like, that was almost three years ago, and maybe three, four years ago. And to think since then, Modric has just still been yeah. basically indispensable um, and is still probably, at, at the very, very least and minimum, one of the best central midfielders in the world still at, this, at his age. And he's, and he's playing at such a high level. So do you, if he starts classical, does that mean he rests or he just maybe comes off like in the second half against Shakhtar? The fact that Modric, yeah, the fact that Modric came off an injury uh, or during the FIFA break makes this a little bit interesting for him. Uh, the Shakhtar game, I mean. Uh, I expect him to start the classical, obviously, but the, the Shakhtar game is a bit trickier for him. I think... You know, the fact that he seems to be uh, physically recovered 100%, he should be fresh. So I think he will probably start against Shakhtar. I don't know. This is just my my instinct here. I, I, I think that maybe Chuameni is the one that might get some rest against Shakhtar. I don't know. It's just uh, it's just prediction at this point, obviously. It's just uh, gut feelings at this point. But I think that Chuameni might actually need a bit more rest than Modric, considering that Modric seems to have recovered all fine. And, uh, and that obviously those 10 days he spent off uh, training all that may mean that he's fresh and, uh, and and ready to play. So it'll be interesting. I think Ancelotti will will make uh, more rotations than, than the Vinicius one we talked about. Well, he's played, he's one of one, two, three, four outfield players who have played over 500 minutes so far this season. And it, it's kind of like an underrated story in some sense, although not really. Basically, it's going to be a Casemiro situation with him. Casemiro was always like mm. top two, top three at worst in terms of minutes in the squad. And it's partly because only he could do what he did in the squad. And now Chumani is in a similar situation where he's the only pure single anchor pivot in the team. And the other ones are just more hybrid versions of, of that who can't really do some of the defensive positioning and tackling stuff that he can do. Kamavinga can do it, but it's not as positionally as good in that position as, as true many is. And so, and that's going to be, so I agree with you. It's not someone I thought of, but it's certainly in terms of who needs to be rested. I think he has a case. Vinicius has, oh, is the only one over 700 minutes. And I think there's definitely a case for him to rest in this game. Also, in part because you could, you should probably still be able to win this game or at least get a draw. And again, you're not going to be eliminated from this group, no matter like how you'd have to like. It would take a, a meteor to like hit the earth for the for us to not qualify for the group stages. So you should be able to get by with with Vinicius not playing this one. Um, so I I could see that in terms of I could even see more minutes for for Asensio in this game, possibly a, a start or or you know first off the bench. So I, if in terms of rest, Vinicius, Chuomeni, I'd also try to get Fede off the pitch as quickly as I, po mm. I, I possibly yes. could. Um, yes. And those are the ones I'd be, I'd, be, I'd be kind of worried about. The other one in terms of like, it's not that urgent, but I definitely don't want to see Mendy miss the Clasico because his defensive contribution against their, whether it's Dembele or Rafinha, even I don't think Ansu will start, especially on the right. So maybe not him, but he, but I, I would definitely like to see a healthy Mendy for this one. And with the center backs, I'm not necessarily that worried because Rudiger can fill in for anyone and probably maybe even do a better job than if not at the very least meet the threshold of, of, of meeting their performances in terms of being as good as Militao and, and, and Alaba. So, yeah. You also, Kian, I think, 
you also have to assume that Lucas Vazquez will start because he featured in, in the press conference today. So that mm. usually means that the player will start. Mm-hmm. And that obviously would mean rest for Carvajal, which is something that makes total sense considering how injury prone Carvajal has been and also how important he's been this season I think he's been one of the uh, I tweeted the other day I think he's been one of the unsung heroes this season and so I think it makes total sense to rest him uh, in this game and I think Cancelotti will too Do we get a Hazard cameo against Shakhtar? Some fans are hoping um, to, to see that I I don't know. Maybe it gets that deep in, in into the rotation. Uh, I just think we have to all assume and, uh, and accept the fact that he's behind both uh, Asensio and Mariano in the rotation. So it'll be interesting to see how deep Ancelotti wants to go with his rotations. But maybe, maybe you know, there's a case for him playing on the left uh, flank if uh, if if Vinicius is rested. Although I would give that opportunity to be to to Rodrigo ahead of him, but. I don't know. I don't know what Ancelotti has in store. It, it, definitely, I could see some minutes from Hazard this this match. I'm not sure if if he'll start. I, I, I lean towards no. Has he played classical yet? Oh, that's a good question. He probably has. He probably has. Even for the bench, he probably. I have to assume he has. I have, I have to, to assume he has. Because yeah, he had him for the to. longest time. And I think Las Vegas was like maybe one of the first one, but we're not going to count that if you played that one. I'd have to look it well, up. That, that's, not, that's not good from him, definitely, if he hasn't played a classical by, by this time. Maybe we're wrong, and, 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 if, and if so, we're wrong. But if, if when we signed Eden Hazard and if a gunman put a gun to your head and said, hey, Lucas, will Hazard play one classical before he leaves Real Madrid? <laughs> what would you have said? <laughs> I would say that, uh, that definitely otherwise Real Madrid would have probably disappeared or something because of, uh, of a pandemic or whatever he does. But it's definitely, it was very difficult to predict the, uh, the way things uh, uh, have gone for, for Hazard and Real Madrid both. I'll look it up before the podcast is over. Um, your as you've announced on Twitter and you and I have talked about it on WhatsApp, you're writing a piece about Karim Benzema in anticipation of him winning Ballon d'Or and you're going to hit publish on it, ready to go when the, when he receives the award. What is it that's on your mind when writing that article in terms of the content? And what is it that um, I suppose if you were to give us a primer on, on, on how you would present, present the article? Yes, I I wanted to 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 give this kind of tribute to Benzema the same way I I wrote a, a feature on Cristiano Ronaldo when he won his first Ballon d'Or with Real Madrid back in 2014, I think it was, uh, and uh, I think Benzema deserves it, and I I didn't know how to how to tackle the whole idea of of uh, of this article, but I I think I will. I will structure it by kind of going through the different uh, stages he's been through in Real Madrid. Like I saw it in three. Di- I so- I think and I see his career as in three different. Uh, his career in Real Madrid, mind you, as in three different stages. This one. The early struggles, uh, obviously, with uh, Pellegrini and Mourinho in his first uh, two, three seasons, two and a half seasons, probably with the club, when he was behind the wine in the in the order. Then the the middle part and the most extensive part of his career with Real Madrid is when he was Cristiano Ronaldo's uh, Robin, if you will, like the, his uh, his most important ally within the squad, and al- also one of the reasons why Cristiano Ronaldo. F- was able to to get the numbers he got with Real Madrid. Obviously, all credit to to Ronaldo and all, but we all have to uh, accept that Benzema was a big part in in Ronaldo's success, and even Ronaldo always acknowledges in in some of his interviews. And then, obviously, the last uh, part and the most uh, long part in the article, if you will, will be you know how well he played after Ronaldo's departure, how big of a mentor he was with uh, with the younger guns. And obviously, 
um, uh, explaining how well he did last season and how he got uh, the opportunity to win this award by uh, writing history with Real Madrid last season in what was one of the most uh, decisive uh, seasons from a Real Madrid player in the history of the club, I think. Certainly. It, really one of the most memorable, one of the most heroic. I, this is why I always like to wait until a player virtually retires before we make up our mind on them. I know that's kind of a weird thing to say because we can obviously analyze as we go, but no player has shot up the Real Madrid history rankings in more no. than Benzema has no. in like two years. Like no. it's crazy. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. It's yeah. crazy. Nobody, nobody would have predicted. I, no. I was like, it's easy to say this now in hindsight, but I promise you, I, I've always been one of the biggest Benzema fans or Benzema believers, if you yeah. will, in Real Madrid's fan base. Like in 2000. 11, I bought my first uh, Karim Benzema shirt when he wasn't still an established starter in, in, in Real Madrid and all that. And not even me or not even his biggest believers or his biggest uh, supporters could see this kind of uh, season from Benzema, the one he put, uh, he put up last, last season. It's just something that wasn't even uh, on our minds. Like, I, I always like accepted the fact that Benzema was going to 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 be one of these. Uh, I, I write this in the article. One of these cult players, cult heroes, like like the reals and the original fans know about, but the big public uh, really don't don't know or or, or know about uh, their game or other numbers uh, and all that. And and now all of a sudden he wins the Ballon d'Or and becomes one of the best players in the history of the club just because of what he's done in the last two or three seasons, mainly the last season. But it's something that, to be honest, no one saw come. No one saw it coming um, this kind of season from him or this kind of uh, great, greatness from it, uh, from a statistical standpoint, from a leadership standpoint and all that, not even his biggest supporters or his biggest, his biggest believers like me. So what what he has done uh, likely or, or even remotely possible, I don't think. So it's, it's definitely mind-blowing to see how Benzema, when with 34 years old, 14 years after being compared to Anelka, after being behind D.Y.N. in the, in the, in the rotation, and after the, the Bernabe oh fans... Adebayor at, at one. Yeah, yeah, I write this in the article too. Adebayor signed on a loan deal when Iwain got injured. Uh, the fans singing Morata, Morata when Benzema was taking a penalty because they want Morata to take the penalty instead. After what he's gone through after being banned from the French national team, obviously that's an entire deep controversy, maybe not related to football, definitely. But again, after what he's been through, the fact that he wins this, the fact that he carried Real Madrid to the success, to an historic success last season, like the, the Champions League and La Liga double last season with 34 years old, is just my boy. And one of the greatest stories I've been around since, since covering Real Madrid for sure. I remember when he first signed from Lyon, just before we had signed him, we were close to signing David Villa, or at the very least, there was a lot of yeah. links with David Villa. And I mm -hmm. remember when it ended up being Benzema instead of David Villa, I got way more excited. Even though David Villa was more established, is one of the greatest strikers in Spanish football history, and did great things at Barca, there was something about Benzema that excited me because of his youth. And also, it's interesting to see how far he's come because at, when you watch his highlights from, La, from Lyon, his stylistic, his stylistically yeah, is much different, different than player. he is now. Then he, look, he was yeah. very much, he emulated Ronaldo Nazario, the way he dribbled. He was the and, next Ronaldo Nazario, yeah. yeah. His stepovers, his cutting, and then far post finishes, low in the corner, very much Ronaldo Nazario as the, the way he shot it, the way he placed it. Now he's just different. He's a midfielder, defensive workhorse. And, you know, again, to your point about how far he's come, I mean, he, he overlapped with Raul and he's still here 13 years later. We'll be here probably at least another year. So 14, maybe even 15. We don't know how this is going to go. But uh, you mentioned all those strikers he competed with. He outlasted all of them for a combination of different reasons. Um, but he also... Um, 
I remember doing a mailbag. Someone asked me, where does he rank in Real Madrid history? And this was years ago. Ronaldo was still on the team. So it was at least 2018, but maybe 2017. And I think I ranked him seventh among all-time Real Madrid strikers. And I, there was definitely a section of the fan base who just scrutinized and attacked me for that. There was like, how can you put Benzema so oh, yeah. high? Yeah. Like, that's what we're talking about. And now it's like, now he's probably number one. The only one I can see that I think is, in my opinion, still ahead of him is Pushkas. But I think Benzema will pass Pushkas if he hasn't already by the time he retires. So it doesn't even matter at this point. Benzema was number one. And so to think that that was like, what, four or five years ago? And now we're talking about this is how far he's come. He has a Ballon d'Or waiting for him. I did not see that come at all. And it's not no, that I hated no, no him way. or no nothing way. like that. It's just that no. he pleasantly surprised me, I got to say. Really, I was really. comfort. Yeah, I was comfortable. I was comfortable with his role and his status of cult hero, with him saying, "I play for the ones who understand football, and not for the general public. I don't play for numbers. I play for the ones who understand football." I was fine with that kind of role. With that kind, I I was fine with supporting that kind of player. You know, I was comfortable supporting for that kind of player, and then he reached uh, the pinnacle of the sport. This is something so great. Seeing it's, and I know this might worse or this might get some some hardcore football fans a, a bit bored, but it reminds me of Jokic really. Like I didn't expect Jokic to win two MVPs. No, n- not at all. Like I didn't expect him to 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 reach this kind of level. I remember four or five years ago uh, supporting Jokic to be an All Star, supporting Jokic to uh, hey look at this guy. He plays for the Nuggets. The Nuggets are terrible, but look at what this guy is doing. Oh, don't don't you care about poor thingies? Don't you care about Carl Anthony Towns? You have to look at uh, and watch Nikola Jokic play. And I remember, you know, the, being doing this kind of speech and uh, pretty much to, to, to no one. And it was it reminds me a lot. The Benzema situation reminds me a little bit of this. Like the general public now appreciates Jokic's game and now the general public appreciates also Benzema's game. And it's, it's really great to, to see for the ones who were there from the from the very beginning. Yeah, Uh it's also crazy to think like 2018, he had such a poor year in terms of scoring, like just missed so many chances, missed so many chances. And I also think it's a testament to his mental fortitude to be at that quote unquote rock bottom. I mean, he was doing things defensively. He was also providing, producing, like it was in the, involved in the buildup of the goals, right? But I think it was mentally, he must have been in a really tough place because it was just criticism, criticism. Criticism, criticism, plus lack of goals, lack of goals, lack of goals. And you're the Real Madrid striker. And no matter how much you show fans of a, a Real Madrid fan, all the great things he's doing besides scoring, the standard is we don't care. Put the ball in the back of the net. That's it. And, and he bounced back. And he not only bounced back, but he led the team. When, and this is, this is where his greatness comes into me, apart from the numbers, is he led a team that just lost its best player in club history. He led the team. And Absolutely. the team needed a leader and he rose. And that's where I think that's what separates him from other players. That's what separated him from Bale. That's what separated him from Asensio in that moment. And, and, and that's what separates him from and makes him one of the greatest players in club history now because he has the numbers plus he has the clutch gene, the leadership of last season, what he did in the last two years. It's, he has everything. He has everything to be considered an all-time great now and it's undisputable. And longevity aside, because of the of the captain thing, because I mean he would wear the armband uh, no matter what. What you mentioned yeah. makes him a worthy Real Madrid captain. It's what makes him like it makes it should make Real Madrid fans proud that this guy is their captain. It's uh, it's what makes one player like all he's been through, and obviously the the level of of his performances and. And and also his leadership is what should make Real Madrid fans proud about having you know a guy who who went through all that a guy who is a foreigner a uh, French guy still worthy and and definitely a respectable figure inside Real Madrid history but also worthy of being the the team the team captain yeah yeah hundred percent 
Um, <clears throat> on that note, it's not mailbag day, but we do have a, a question left over from the mailbag who is from a guaranteed patron. Um, so I thought we could take it and it fits into this awesome. discussion because I know you wanted to also kind of touch on it. How are you doing for time? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. Right. Let's go for it. Yeah. This question is from our patron Khan P. Khan says, "What's going on with Benzema and his not being as decisive or on target this season? Do you think he just significantly outperformed last season, and is regressing to the mean, or is this potentially the first sign of age-related drop-off? He hasn't looked as explosive lately. I'd be the last to ever doubt King Benz, but our lack of alternatives makes me worried when we get to the tail end of a packed season." The lack of alternatives is a pro is a problem. Whenever Benzema is not in great form, the team obviously needs Benzema to be in great form. I think he was in great form against Shakhtar. I think he was brilliant against Shakhtar. Obviously, his finishing wasn't there. I think he missed also a penalty again uh, against Osasuna, which cost Real Madrid two points. That's I mean, there's no other way uh, no other way around it. He should have made that penalty. And he he didn't, and it was Real Madrid two points. That's for certain, and we have to be fair. I think we also should be fair by accepting and, and acknowledging that he was great. I'm, I'm saying great against Shakhtar, even though he didn't finish uh, his chances. I think he his playmaking was was great in that game, and I think he's just lacking a bit of lack of uh, of confidence in front of goal right now at the moment, which is why I saw I, I kind of think that it would be useful for him to to play against Shakhtar on Tuesday, just to increase his confidence a little bit, bring that confidence back up a little bit before the World Cup. I also think it's, it's kind of due to to a bit of mental fatigue, if you will, after last season. You know, he probably is anticipating the fact that he's also about to become a, a Ballon d'Or if, if everything goes according to plan. Also, he's going to be one of the big, the biggest figures in the in the next World Cup and all that. Maybe it all it's all related. I think it's... You know, I, I don't think it's reasonable to expect Benzema to play the way he did last season. I think what some kind of dropping his form would be fair, reasonable, and, and easy to, ex, to 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 expect. And the same goes for Courtois, who was the other player who was uh, unbelievable last season. I think it's so unfair to expect uh, that kind of greatness from from your players year uh, year after year. So. I think he would be, he will benefit a lot from 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 scoring a few goals here and there from from playing well in El Clasico and and keep being the the player he was last season. I, I I'm not worried about him about this being a, a decline or age related thing right now. I think it's more down to, to to confidence and maybe a little bit of mental fatigue right now. I'm willing to bet that we look back on this period of Benzema's season and say ah we just you know, obviously he's going to come back and rebound from this. It's he's too good of a player. I, so I, my explanation of the form up until the point he got injured against Celtic was that it's just, it's just him finding his feet before, while the season starts, it's not a worrying issue. And then that's that. And then the X and it, you know, he's, he's good. Not every player is going to be lights out every single game of their lives. It's going to, you know, there's a little mini blip in form and whatever and, or scoring. And then once he gets going, he's going to get going. And then the explanation to me, since he got back from injury, um, was it, is it three, two games he played? Osasuna, yeah, two. Osasuna and Osasuna Shakhtar, and Shakhtar right? yeah. because he didn't play against Kadabe. Um, my explanation yeah. for Osasuna was, well, he just got back from injury. Like this is his first game back. And he did score an offside goal, to be fair, which did not count, whatever. But I mean, in terms of at least, it told me at least where his head is at. And then against Shakhtar, he was brilliant. He just couldn't couldn't put the ball in the back of the net. And then he didn't play against Katafe. So that's just my explanation of those two periods. And beyond that, I, I'm not too worried. I, I feel like we have something brewing in Classico, and I think he's going to show his best version. I agree. And I agree. And we have to remind ourselves that we were willing to bet on Benzema being a great player when he was scoring six goals a season. So we should remain patient now that he's done what he's done. I think we should still have a little more pay, more patience with him now that he's done what he's done. 
especially considered, considering that he's still playing at a high level. Maybe he's finishing, but he's still he's not cost the team uh, in terms of perform overall performance. I don't think the team is playing bad because he's he's not at his best form. I think it's just a matter of him finishing a few plays here and there. But if you were willing to gamble or, or to take a bet on him when he was scoring five goals a season, you I think it's still it still makes sense to be to be patient with him a little bit more. Yeah, I also think in terms of age related things, it's not to me. We I don't see the age aspect of what I'm seeing right now either. No, no. He has no physical decline. He has no mental decline or talent decline. Against mm. Shakhtar, again, he had every single technical ability that he's ever had. And, you know, it's just a scoring funk. That's all it is. I think what you can see, like, in terms of, like, age-related decline among players who take care of their bodies, Luka Modric being an example of this we can go by, is that what might tend to happen is that you don't, he hasn't lost his greatness at all in big games at all. And even in some of the smaller games, he, he just goes on and does brilliant things. But what happened with Modric to an extent was that he some of his great great transcendent performances were fewer and far between exactly. that's something that might happen with benzema soon um but mm-hmm. but it still doesn't make it, he's still one of the best and uh i don't so i don't really necessarily see the age part of this uh, what i see is more of just a unnatural drop in in scoring form which happens to anybody so that's the way i see yeah. it but it's also fair and 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 reasonable to say that it if this happens to him like if he's if his best performances happen uh, more sporadically than 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 more in a more frequent uh, form like like it's happened with Modric it's true that the, the team will probably uh, lack a bit of a scoring presence unless Rodrigo can can score some of these goals uh, week in week out against the smaller teams Benzema will keep playing at a high level but if 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 his scoring isn't an, uh, as consistent as it was. It's true that Real Madrid should probably have an alternative waiting. That's, that man is probably Rodrigo, also assuming the fact that Vinicius keeps improving uh, week in and week out his, his scoring form. Yeah. How, how many goals did Benzema score last year? 44 over 46 appearances. Yeah. So it's fine if he doesn't score 44 goals again, provided that Rodrigo and Vinicius and Fede continue to keep producing goals. Like if he got, if Benzema got like, let's say 30 goals this season, but then Fede got 15, Rodrigo got 15, doesn't matter. That's fine. The offensive production can be dispersed. Just to look at the numbers. I mean, we're not talking about this massive sustained months of poor scoring. We're talking, this is what he's done so far. His XG is point is 5.3 and he scored three goals in La Liga. And so it's just, <laughs> It's he's, underperforming the end of the world, yeah. he's underperforming his XG right now for the time being. And in, in, in the last three years, he basically wasn't. So uh, let's just call it for what it is. It's a bit of a scoring funk and he'll, he'll rebound. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I can hear my kids just woke up from their nap. They're home today because <laughs> it's Thanksgiving in Canada. So they may just barge oh, into here. So happy yeah. Thanksgiving to, thank to you, you and thank, your family, man. Thank you very much. Grateful for you. Grateful for everyone on the manager major staff and grateful to all our listeners who are awesome um but i'm happy to wrap it here do you have anything awesome. anything else you want to say no just uh wish you a happy thanksgiving there in canada and, and a safe trip to 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 madrid uh to cover the classical for for the site thank you my friend thank you so much uh it was a pleasure as always we'll be back well i have to talk to you about when we're going to record mailbag this week because i'm traveling thursday so we might have to do it on friday but we'll figure it out yeah all right All right. Thanks, Lucas. Appreciate you. Take care, my friend. You too. Hey, Managing Madrid listeners. Thank you for tuning in. Appreciate your support. Just want to let you know that we'll be back on Tuesday night, right after the Real Madrid versus Shakhtar game for a live Zoom podcast. And that goes up exclusively for patrons. Patrons get a Zoom link one hour after the game. They click the link. They join us on the call. They join us on the podcast live. There is a chat box. There is a video analysis live on the show that we can't repost due to copyright reasons. There's also a Q&A session at the end where you can ask us questions face-to-face. And to get access to the link and also after the podcast is recorded, if you can't join or you want to listen to it again, you want access to it, again, all of that is over on patreon.com slash managingmadrid. 
Every single Champions League postgame show is exclusively for patrons. And if you want to be part of that Real Madrid family and get access to that, again, patreon.com slash managing Madrid. It costs less than a Starbucks coffee per month, and you get a ton more value in return. So see you on the inside. Thank you so much, and hala Madrid.